Hello again, and uh, welcome to all of you. I think there are some people here who did not attend the, the last session with John McWhorter. Um, th this session is going to be more of a discussion, a bit of a debate uh, with John McWhorter, who I think will be appearing here uh, shortly. We also have Olivier Guez, who's a French-born author, uh, a writer of novels, including his most recent novel, which is going to come out in English uh, soon, called The Disappearance of uh, Joseph Mengele. Uh, Olivier uh, lived in Berlin for a long time. He now lives in, in Rome, uh, which I'm, I'm very jealous about, actually. Uh, but is a, a true understand. European, born in Strasbourg, and uh, has, has lived all over the continent, and my, my hope is that in, in this session, which is, you know, is called Identity, Politics, and Wokeness, Totalitarianism of the Left, that we'll be able to talk a little bit more about the kind of European dimension of, of this phenomenon that is uh, wokeness and identity politics. Unfortunately, Nezreen Malik, the columnist for uh, the Guardian, who was supposed to join this, is not going to be able to uh, join us this evening, um, which, uh, which is a bit of a pity because she was sort of the, the representative of, of the uh, kind of opposite side of this debate. So I might have to assume, assume that part, um, which, which might be a bit difficult for me. Um, in any case, um, do we have uh, John McWhorter? There he is, John John. I guess Nisreen uh, saw your saw your talk and, and thought that she she just uh, she she didn't have what it takes to stand toe to toe with you in this in this debate, John, on on, on wokeness. But uh, you look you Is look that really confused. what happened? No, I, I don't know. I'm I'm joking. I don't know. We we had some uh, some difficulty uh, uh, reaching her. I guess. Sorry anyway. about that. This is the kind of thing that happens uh, with Zoom. In a world of Zoom, you know, you can't go and kind of grab the person and drag them to the stage. Um, but I would like to, you know, maybe uh, pick up where we, we left off in, in the last session. Uh, we, we talked a lot about um, Olivier wokeness as kind of a new, a new religion, and I, I would I'd like to get your perspective on this because a lot of things that start in, in the U.S., uh, a lot of good things end up coming to Europe, but a lot of bad things also as, as well. And from, from your kind of perch in, in, in Rome and in, in Europe, um, how, how do you see this kind of debate uh, influencing you know, intellectual thought and, and also just general society in Europe when it comes to identity politics and, and wokeness. Hi, good evening. Um, I mean, as a, as a writer, and uh, like for many, many writers in Europe, many artists, we're all concerned by this question of wokeness and of cancel culture, and we, I'm very worried about this, and lots of my friends are also very worried about this, about what's going on in the US. I mean, some people are kind of persecuted because they say it's something, or because people think they say it's something. Uh, some books are burned or disappear, some people disappear also from the picture, so we're all concerned. I mean, from a European perspective, I mean, it's, I'm not a specialist of wokeness, but um, I can say a few words. I have the, the feeling that the wokeness is uh, extremely weak in Italy. I think they basically they don't give a shit about wokeness, which is kind of interesting. Uh, they're very Latin, very, it's, a, it's a very old world. Uh, I mean, when in my neighborhood in Rome, sometimes I have the feeling I live in 1982, and so wokeness is very, very far from uh, Rome. This is my feeling. Uh, in France, it's different, of course. Uh, France is different. Uh, wokeness arrived uh, the last years. It's uh, created many debates. It's a small but very active minority, uh, which is, I mean, yeah, very influenced by all what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in the US. What is interesting, maybe we, we will talk about this, but uh, 
I think the um, I went to the U.S. in 2004, you know, with this program, uh, Young Elite program, and the, the, um, you spend one week in Washington and then you travel all around the U.S. for something like three, three, four weeks. They call it Global Emerging Leader, something big world. And the, the U.S. started to, to recruit very different people in, uh, at the end, something like 10 years ago. Uh, lots of people look like me, something like 15 years ago. And they invited uh, lots of minority, which is very good, of course, but I think they, lots of people also tried to, there was a strategy of influence. Maybe we will talk about this, but it's interesting. So it's important, it's pretty important. I mean, it's a small movement, but it takes lots of space in France, especially in the media, they're, they're powerful in the media. I have the feeling that Germany is also, there is a, a wokeness influence. Germany likes to import lots of American stuff, the best and, <laughs> and the worst. Uh, England, it's very strong also for, for many reasons. And for the rest, I mean, the other European countries, I have the feeling that in Eastern Europe, it's very, very weak. Scandinavia, it could be strong. Uh, this is my feeling. I mean, this is very general overview. I could give an example from a Roman perspective. Um, if you've been to Rome, maybe you've been to the Foro Olimpico, where the Olympic Games took place in 1960. And in front of the swimming pool, you have a long column, uh, which is dedicated to Mussolini. And it's written, Le Duce. And the first time you see it, I mean, it's, it's kind of shocking, because it's still written Mussolini. I think it was built in the 20s or in the early 30s. But I think it's right that this column still exists in Rome because you can't cancel your history like that. Uh, it's part of the history of Italy. It's important that people think about what happened in Italy uh, during the 20s and the 30s till the mid 40s. And um, this is an example, I think. Maybe some people, if it would have been in the States, I mean, they would have. Some people would have wanted to, to destroy, to cancel this uh, column. And uh, I think it would have been a big mistake because you can't cancel your history. You can learn from history, but you can't cancel history. Otherwise, it's very, it's extremely worrying, I would say. This is the first example. Mm. I mean, th that's a debate that is still uh, very current in, in the U.S. I think uh, just this week, maybe yesterday, even uh, the, the last sort of large statue of, or the largest statue of uh, Robert E. Lee, who was the... Uh, the general of the Confederacy who led uh, the Confederate troops in, in the Civil War was removed from, I believe, the capital of the State House in the state of Virginia. Um, how, how do you see this debate, John? Because it's obviously already kind of uh, reached uh, and sort of passed, I would say, the uh, kind of climax in, in the U.S. in a way, uh, where people have just sort of torn down all of these uh, statues. A lot of people would say, well, you know, that's a bit extreme. You know, a lot of these figures were problematic, but, you know, in, in kind of the interest of encouraging debate about our history in, in the U.S. and so forth, it might be better to leave them up because, not because we, uh, you know, put these people on a pedestal, literally, but because they remind us of our history and it's worth kind of discussing uh, what happened, who they are, and, and, and so forth. Um, although there might be exceptions to that, and maybe the state capital isn't the place for a, a Robert E. Lee statue. But how do you, how do you see that debate from, from where you sit? Yeah, it's, um, it's part of why I call this a religion, in that the rampant destruction of so many of these monuments lately, and the idea that names be taken off of buildings of people who Hitherto, we would have thought of as you know, pretty innocent and even admirable people. All of this comes from the basic idea that battling power differentials is to be central to absolutely everything, which means that in San Francisco, a school board actually wanted to be taken seriously, removing the names of people like Abraham Lincoln from school buildings, because even though Abraham Lincoln presided over the emancipation of slaves, he still 
in his views about black people and what should happen to black people after emancipation were not ones that we would have today. So since he was by our standards, a racist, then you shouldn't name a school after him as if it doesn't sum up his achievement that he emancipated slaves and that he was a very large person in terms of various other accomplishments. And so what we're being asked to do is take a point of view towards symbols of the past which is being presented as a kind of complexity. It's supposed to be that we have reached a new layer of understanding, but really it's primitive. The idea is that we evaluate people from the past based on one thing about them, based on studiously ignoring that people are captives of their time. People who lived in the past didn't have access to the ideas we have now. The occasional, very unique, usually peculiar person can see beyond their own time, but most people, and even great people in a particular period, can't. And so we look at, say, a Thomas Jefferson, who was a brilliant and accomplished figure in so many ways. And there's a certain person who tells us that the main thing we're supposed to think about him is that he thought that Black people were inferior to white people which is what 99.99% .99 of white people at the time all thought. We're supposed to mainly think about that as opposed to his other accomplishments. That is thinking along the lines of the Taliban destroying statues in Afghanistan not so very long ago. We're being asked to be primitive, being asked to be simplistic in the name of what's supposed to be some sort of ideological advance. And I think that the pendulum is shifting somewhat. And there are some statues that should be taken down. I frankly think that given that if there's a statue of Robert E. Lee, the reason it's up is because he fought for the Confederacy. Now, I'm told by people who really know a lot about Robert E. Lee that there are various very nice things about him and what he did. But the reason people put up a statue of him was because of his being a military leader of the Confederacy and the preeminent one. Given that that's the case, I can understand how we might not want to have those statues up now, sure. But then you get to more ambiguous cases, such as Woodrow Wilson, who was a complete bigot, but he did some other things too. Do you take his name off of buildings? Some people say yes, some people say no. You know, George Washington is the main thing we remember about him, that he owned slaves, or there's some other things. We're being asked to abjure complexity. That's what this is. And it's alarming, because what it really is, is it's giving people a past a pass to not engage history, to not engage the complexity of looking at the past and its relationship to the present. It is asking us to basically dumb ourselves down in the name of what is frankly a very simplistic ideology that has it that we're supposed to think of battling power differentials as the quintessence of being an engaged person. So yeah, these are tough things. I mean, one of the, the most interesting iterations of, of this whole debate, and you, you pointed to, to Jefferson, who's obviously the, the author of the Declaration of Independence, which is sort of one of the seminal kind of texts about democracy uh, ever, ever written. Um, and, and, and George Washington is that th their names are affixed to so many things in the United States, including cities and states, uh, that it would be uh, quite, quite difficult to cancel them altogether. There's a, uh, uh, I'll wait for you to get situated there, John. Yeah, we're getting a, a good tour of your uh, home there in Queens. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a small university in, in Virginia called Washington and Lee, um, which is named both for George Washington and uh, Robert E. Lee, which is sort of a funny combination. Uh, and I think they're talking about maybe changing the name uh, to, uh, to something else or to WNL. It's also known as WNL, for example. It's a bit like what they did with Kentucky Fried Chicken, where when, when people figured out that fried food was bad for your cholesterol, uh, that was also bad for Kentucky Fried Chicken's sales, so they changed the name to KFC. Uh, so I, I think this is, might be uh, the way we're headed, but I, I don't know what that means uh, for, for Washington, uh, D.C. Um, coming back to the comparison with, with religion, um, one of the kind of most influential books in recent years about identity politics and, and, and this space uh, came from France, uh, Submission by uh, Urbeck. Um, which I think many people in the in the audience are familiar with. Uh, 
l looking back now, Olivier, what, what would you say has been the, the, the impact of, of that book? And just a reminder, it was published on, on the day that uh, terrorists uh, attacked uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo and, and also committed uh, this, this massacre in uh, the Bataclan, I believe it was the same. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what has been the effect of, of that book on the debate in, in France? I wouldn't say that, I mean, Wilbeck is, a, of course, a, a public figure in France and in Europe and maybe in the States also, but I don't think people take him too seriously as a political thinker. But Welbeck feels uh, what's in the air in France for something like more than 20 years. And Welbeck uh, felt that um, identity politics is poisoning the debate in France. Um, this has been going on for, it's difficult to say when it started, but I would say that 2015 and 2015 is definitely uh, uh, a very important moment and uh, of course because of the attacks on Charlie Hebdo and then at the end of the year on the Bataclan and other bars and restaurants. Um, identity politics is uh, a various topic in France. Uh, of course we have a completely different history from the States. I mean uh, our identity politics is very different from the ones in the US, we don't have such a slave history, but we have a colon long, long colonial history, and especially with the Arab world, the African world, but especially with the Arab world. And um, what I think is dangerous that we're importing um, concepts which have not so many things with the French context. I mean, the colonial history, again, is very different from the slave history of the states. But this import of uh, concepts has really been poisoning the debate in France. And what you can see is it's exactly like in the US. Basically, all this wokeness and identity politics and uh, are creating, are building walls between communities instead of trying to find a consensus on history. I mean, the colonial history of France is very complex and it's very hot issue, very difficult issue for sure. But in, instead of trying to find a consensus about this history, uh, instead of building bridges between communities, all this identity politics is creating uh, walls which are higher and higher and deeper and deeper. And this is extremely dangerous because you don't only create uh, walls between communities, but you also fuel an extremely strong backlash from people who find this theory is not only dangerous but completely opposed to the, um, to the French uh, model of universalism, which is the complete opposite. I mean, there would be lots of things to say about how it worked, this universalism, but still. And plus you fuel also, of course, the, the extreme right, uh, which just expected this kind of uh, debate to be imported in France. Uh, so basically what you can see, uh, what, you, what we saw uh, happen in the US in uh, the last decade, uh, culminating with uh, the election of Trump as a reaction to all these debates, uh, you see it all over Europe. Um, I mean, Marine Le Pen and his uh, father movement, Le, Le, Le Front National, was always very strong because it was related to, not only, but to this colonial history. But this, of course, uh, fueled not only Marine Le Pen movement, but lots of extreme right thinkers. Maybe you've been, you heard about Eric Zemmour, for instance, uh, who was a very strong, strong uh, extreme right polemist and was using all this identity politics. So basically, um, soumission, and this is the genius of Welbeck, he feels what's going on, but I don't think anyone would base any political thoughts about, uh, about his books. But it gives the, the temperature of, of, of the country, and especially at that time. But the, again, the, the attacks in 2015 were a major uh, cut in the history of, of France. Because, of course, and this is always the logic of the Islamists, uh, they want uh, 
them too, in fact, to, to build walls between communities, and that suspicion is growing because of the attacks. And uh, this is what uh, submission submission uh, showed at at the time. Uh, John, what, what do you think it is about about this movement that that has made it really an, an international phenomenon? Because if if you look at the individual countries, there really are distinct differences. I mean, in, in the United States, we obviously have this sort of original sin with 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 slavery. Much different history than, as Olivier was just pointing out, you know, France has its colonial history, but you know, this is a bit different. And and and, and Germany. Uh, didn't really have a colonial, very brief colonial history, um, not like the, the, the French history, and, and didn't have a history of, of slavery. And, and yet, uh, these ideas do travel. When George Floyd uh, was was murdered, for example, uh, you know, we saw people out in the streets in, in the UK as well. Uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement really kind of resonating there, uh, even though they're very far removed from, uh, you know, at least geographically, uh, from what's going on in the US. But what, what, what is it about these sort of identity politics and wokeness do you think that, that makes them so potent um, across borders? Well, you know, th this could be the subject of a whole conference or a book itself, but I have been... Your next book. ...to see, <laughs> been used to see um, this way of thinking jumping across the ocean and taking effect in other places. And it seems to me, one thing to remember, this is the outer circle of it, is that to think in this way is gratifying. It feels good to be part of this religion because you are constantly able to show that you're a good person by striking blows, even if only abstract, against being a racist person. That feels good. And it also is a way of bonding with other people. It makes you feel part of something special. And the special is a key word here you feel enlightened. You feel like you're ahead of the curve. You're the one that knows how things are really working. That feels good. And so it wouldn't be logical if that stayed only within the United States. But if you look at where it's taken the strongest hold, it seems to me that colonial history does matter, or in terms of where we quote unquote are today, geographically, in terms of analogies to that colonial history, it seems that this really holds on in places that either had a history of slavery, um, plantation slavery and participation in related activities. And that includes Scandinavia. You know, we don't hear that much about the Swedish and the Danish role in the plantation economy, but it was, it was definitely there. And then with Germany, there are the things that we don't really want to talk about, but it wasn't so much about the subjugation of black people overseas, although Germany did do some of that. But then also what happened more recently where there's a guilt to work out. So if you wanted to be really crude about all of this, you could call it a grand efflorescence of white guilt. And of course, that, that is part of the warp and woof of German society as well. And it's not an accident that then you jump to say Poland or Russia and even Italy, and people have very little patience for this. And it's partly what you might call Latin culture as opposed to whatever you know, the culture above it would be called. And it's a, partly a matter of you know, whatever Slavic culture is. But I think partly Poles don't have a guilt to work out about subjugating people in other places. If anything, the Polish identity is about them having been subjugated by so many people over history. And it's the same thing with Russia to the extent that there has been subjugation, it hasn't been in the formalized sense of plantation slavery. And so I think a lot of it is a kind of working out of that kind of guilt, but in a way that goes from an intelligent kind of reckoning into cult-like behavior that's more about assuaging individual senses of insecurity and desires for belonging than in actually helping anybody. So yeah, it's interesting though, Canada has it. England has it, Australia has it, Denmark has it, but not Romania. <laughs> I don't think that's an accident, nor is it an accident that it doesn't rain much in Italy. If Italy had had colonies all over the world, as opposed to its one unfortunate adventure in Ethiopia, I suspect that it would be more popular in Italy, given that it is in, for example, Spain. It's that sort of thing, I think. Can I, can I say just one Please. thing about this? No, I, 
you know, we fully agree. I think we will spend the whole evening uh, being uh, agreeing together, uh, both of us. But I was about to ask a contrarian question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the sense of guilt is extremely important. This is for sure. And uh, the wokeness and all this movement works a bit like uh, communism at its A day. I mean, it, it was good to feel communist in a certain sense because you were. Uh, for the peace, for the equality, uh, for the equal rights of people. That was the whole propaganda. And you feel, as uh, John said, uh, completely enlightened. There was a very interesting uh, happening in Europe in June and July. That was the, the football championship, the European football championship. And some teams wanted to do, uh, you know, what the, the sports team do in the, the US for, for the, the movement Black Lives Matter. And some teams didn't want to do it because by, they by said, taking a knee, by kneeling down, the, you know, the knee on the on the grass, and uh, I mean, all the a full copy of what happened in mm. in the U.S. I fully understood what what happened in the U.S. But and you had a strong debate within every country. At least, for instance, in France, there was a debate: uh, should the French team uh, do this? How do you call it? The, um, you know, the knee on the. Um, there is a word for this. Genuflect? Yeah, exactly. Um, there was a strong debate in France, should the French team do it or not do it? At the end, they didn't do it, but uh, the British did. But in Eastern Europe, it was not a debate, as John said, because it's, uh, it's a completely different history, and they have a complete full, um, pers completely different perspective about all of this. And so uh, this... This is a bit different from wokeness, but still, you could see that it was invading uh, the European uh, public debate during the, the European football ship. It was kind of fascinating, mm. because at, at the end it has nothing to do with uh, the, um, what's going on in Europe these days. We have lots of other problems, we can of course speak about identity, but this direct import from the States during a European football championship was uh, amazing to observe and to analyze. Well, I guess, I guess another aspect of this, though, is that, that countries like Romania and Eastern Europe, they don't have the racial diversity either, right? So you, you don't have the same kind of underswell there. They, they have their own historical debates, mm. which is about communism, which is about what happened during the World War, which is about the nationalist movement, which is about what happened to the Jews mm. during the 20s. I mean, their identity, it's not identity, it's historical memory, which is, I mean, it's huge debates. I mean, it's extremely difficult questions. and. In Poland these days, it's very difficult to speak about this past. Mm. But of course, they have nothing, they don't care about uh, the slave history of America. Maybe they're interested, some people are interested, but it's nothing to do with... I mean, Poland didn't even exist at that time. I mean, you're from the, 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 the late 18th century till the beginning of the 20th century. So it's completely, completely different history. But everything is being imported. This is the, the genius sometimes for the worst of America, this capacity to import all these debates. It's American marketing at its best. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that it is being imported uh, is, is through language and, and the way that language is, is used. And, and John, you're, you're a linguist. Um, one, one of the things that we've seen in, in, in the US uh, is you know a lot of sensitivity around uh, the use of, of gender pronouns. Um, it's also come to Europe now, uh, where I would argue it's even more pronounced just because of the way the, the, uh, the languages are structured. Um, how important is, is language as kind of a vehicle for these, um, these tendencies and this kind of woke movement, would you say? Well, I don't know. It's um, the linguist part of me and the um, societal commentator part of me are really two different people. And I don't think of those sorts of things at the same time as much as many people might think. But this whole woke movement has really helped show what a mess any language actually is, that there's a certain historical contingency, a certain randomness in the labels that we put on things as opposed to the essence of what the labels are. Or that often the way we use language is in order to create an effect beyond what the words mean. So 
10 minutes ago, you called somebody a racist. That was getting a little weary, getting a little old. People contested it. So in about 2014, the term of art became white supremacist. White supremacist used to be something you said about people in the 19th century or you know, somebody who argued against an anti-lynching bill in 1930. All of a sudden, white supremacist is somebody drinking a glass of Chardonnay who you know, has some sort of opposition to some local school ordinance or something. You're a white supremacist. And that's because the word racist became overused just as the word prejudice did before that. But it means that you have a kind of language that shocks people and can be very hurtful when really what's going on is just that people are seeking to get one another's attention because that's what language is about. You have a way of trying to keep it fresh. But then also, I think that it would be so useful to take everything that's going on now and just go back to the very basics of language because it would make it much clearer what the desires are, what the parameters of argument here are. And so when someone kind of scratches their chin nowadays and says that something is problematic, and then about two weeks later, that something has disappeared or that someone is problematic. And two weeks later, that person no longer has their job. What they're saying is not problematic. What they're saying is blasphemous. They mean the same thing as one of Galileo's inquisitors did, not about hurting somebody physically, but it's the same thing. Is that person problematic? What is being said is, is that person uh, incompatible with our religious positions? <laughs> I think it would really be helpful if that's the way people like that were inclined to put it. But instead, we have this custom where blasphemy applies to certain religions and problematic has been adapted to apply to this new religion. But when you say problematic, you sound like you're talking about a computer rather than a religion. And this is just the way language always is. It's not deliberate. It's not a societal scourge that language keeps us from understanding each other in these ways. These things are inevitable. But even the word woke that we're using here, I'm feeling myself a little bit behind. In my head, woke means that you have an understanding of how society works that would be called leftist or left. You understand what structural racism is. You understand that a lot of problems that black people have in America now are due to a culmination of obstacles put in our way in the past. You're woke, that was a good thing. Now it's at the point where when we say woke, what you're supposed to mean is somebody who has those views and insists that everybody agrees with them and will wreak havoc if anybody disagrees. The woke people are annoying. We're talking about a certain kind of woke person, but woke is now a shorthand just for that. I don't use woke that way quite. But I'm beginning to realize that I have to because the word's meaning has changed even since 2015. That's what language is like. And these things happen in raggedy ways. And we're just stuck with that, unfortunately. That's just the way these things work. But when things are so serious, it can be frustrating that even our words and expressions impede us from fully understanding one another. So there's some people listening to this thinking, what's wrong with being woke? Well, that's, well we don't mean woke as in what it meant in 2016. We mean woke as it's come to be applied by a certain kind of person. And like all people, we're speaking in shorthand. Language does that. What, what is the etymology of woke, by the way? Because it was, a, I think, kind of a slang term originally. You're woken right? up. You're awake. Yeah. It right. was a black slang term that meant that you are awake to things that you might miss if you're just kind of going along and not thinking about the larger operations of society. So it's black slang, woke. You're awakened. And now here we are with it. So I do want to come to questions from the audience. So if, if anyone has a question, uh, please raise your your hand. Um, in the meantime, just a follow up on on this this question of the power differential. I mean, you know, and the the use of language. A big aspect of this is the um, you know the, the the feminist movement is also kind of uh, taken this uh, issue by the horns, as it were. Um, and so we've seen kind of a confluence here between the identity politics involving, you know, people's uh, racial identity and, and demanding, you know, to be treated in a certain way, but also uh, in terms of, of gender and particularly in Europe, I think, you know, women standing up and saying, you know, we want to be treated uh, in, 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 a more, in a more equitable we should, uh, yeah, well, this, this is actually a good point. This is unfortunately turned into a mantle. 
as as they call it. This was not ah, the this was not the intention. I've never heard that. And <laughs> none of us would be here if we'd known it was going to turn out this way. Um, and yet here we are. Uh, but. Um, Olivier, uh, how, how do you see that aspect of it? You live in a Latin country, which is, you know, I would uh, to put it diplomatically, is, is known for its sort of masculinity, let's say. Um, how, how are these uh, sort of crosswinds uh, affecting, affecting uh, life, life in Italy, especially, you know, when you, when you look at sort of the recent past, you obviously had Silvio Berlusconi there as... Uh, as prime minister for a long time, and it's it's a country where you turn on the TV on any given day, and and you'll you know you'll just see sort of scantily scantily clad women uh, doing various things. Um, is this having any effect uh, in Italy uh, at all? I mean, I just moved to to Italy, so it's difficult for me to have a, I mean a, a real perspective of what's going on in Italy. But yes, yeah, sometimes I look at the adverts in the newspapers and. Yeah, it's, it's very retro. It's like, I don't know, in, again, like the 80s. I mean, you have a more or less naked woman trying to sell whatever, cars and plastic bags or whatever, everything. So, I mean, Italy is, uh, yes, yeah, still, it's, um, for all, about all these issues, it's, it still lives in, in the past. I mean, there is a movement in Italy. I mean, I, I'm not the person able to, to really speak about this movement, but I, 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 I read the newspapers, and of course they're debating about this. But they don't have the... I think the end of all these movements could be interesting. I mean, the promotion of women, uh, the promotion of racial equality, the, this is not the, the issue. <coughs> the big issues are the methods, the way they do it, the way they point at people... Uh, designing the new enemies, uh, the way they burn books about the forbid movies or piece of art, or, or because someone wrote, because someone was something, the artist has to, to disappear. I mean, this is completely crazy. And this is not going to help anyone, actually. And there is this idea of purity, which is the basis of all the totalitarian movements. I mean, it's impossible to be pure. It's impossible. You, you will, will never find anyone pure. At least your thoughts are impure sometimes, or most of the times. It depends on people. And uh, art is about the, the transformation of about all these thoughts, the, the good ones and the bad ones. And so this very idea of purity is, is extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous. So to go back to, to Italy... This is not. This is not happening the same way. I mean, Berlusconi was, uh, of course, he was like, uh, he was like a puppet. I mean, he was ridiculous. I mean, but it's it shows us. Yeah, I mean, when you compare what's going on with the Me Too movement and what Berlusconi did just a few years before, I mean, it's like two cosmos. Mm. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. So, but I, I wouldn't. I think for me the, the most dangerous thing is the, are the methods. The way it is made and the aggressiveness and the, 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 debate, the debate which becomes a, a fight and the designation of the new enemy. So it's impossible to speak with this enemy. And um, I don't think this is going on in Italy. I think it's going on in France. Very strongly. Well, and in France, you've had some very high-profile cases over the past several years um, involving prominent public figures, Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Uh, but Dominique Strauss-Kahn uh, is a guy who, was, who should have gone to jail. I mean, this is another thing. Uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn is not the symbol of the French uh, man. I hope so. I mean, uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn is a very special case. It's like uh, Epstein in the U.S., or Weinstein. I mean, these people are crazy, but they don't represent, they represent themselves. They have to go to jail. It's a different thing. Um, uh, but what's going on in France? Because we, this is crazy. I mean, I still don't understand why we imported all of this. I mean, the way, for instance, in France, we have four or five uh, news channels working all around, all the time. So basically, they need people to say whatever is, is going on in their heads, and they're they, they, uh, transmitting all of this. So basically, you don't have debates anymore. You have this fight, like on Fox News. And lots of people uh, who are very marginal, 
But because they say so many crazy things, I mean, you have the audience, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a theater. And so they, they build it the same way they did in the US. Germany is different from this because you don't have these uh, news channels going on all, all, all the time. They're starting. No, no. Yeah, but uh, this is a catastrophe. This, but I mean, when I see German politics, because they all work together, they know that they might work in a government. So it's very different in France. It's very frontal what's going on. And in Italy, it's the, the same. It's also um, the parties have to work together. And you don't have this TV, these news channels working all the time. I mean, French is very interesting. Uh, is a very interesting case, and of course, I know much better the French case, because the French have always been anti-American. They never liked really the Americans. They were jealous of America because America basically took the the, the place of France as the you know the lightning lighting house on the on the hill. But the last ten years, we imported everything from America, everything, especially the worst things. <laughs> this is amazing. What, what, what happened in France the last ten years? And what's, uh, I'll just note that on? France is the oldest ally of the United States. Um, are, are there any questions in the audience uh, for our guests here? If it's okay, I will start with a question that came up via the YouTube live stream. Okay. Um, so Stiller asked, but do these columns need to be part of the public space where they could be understood as glorifying the ideas that fascists like Mussolini represent. Why not put it in a museum? This is to your, your well, comment about I, I, the Well, I'm not representing Mussolini, uh, <laughs> you know, in this uh, debate. <laughs> what I'm saying, I think, is um, it could be in a museum. But then it would be kind of... Uh, privatized somehow, even if everybody can go to a museum. I mean, if you go, I mean, if you pass by, this is one of the main um, main streets along the uh, the river, the, the Tibre in, um, Tibre in, uh, in Rome. I mean, you have to face it. Maybe some people who, who, who like the, 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 the fascists or who still feel close to the fascists enjoy it, but most of people um, I guess most of people don't see it anymore. I mean, I'm, because I'm new in the city, I was very impressed by this, and so I still look at it every time I pass by. Mm. But uh, also where it is, I mean, it means uh, the power the fascists had in Italy, that it was a very popular movement, at least at the beginning. And I think it's important, it's interesting that it's still in the middle of the, of the city. But for instance, Berlin is also a very interesting case. I mean, they destroyed the, the people, the, the people's palace, nearly 20 years ago. I think it was a big mistake. I think it was part of German history, of Eastern German history, and they, they should have kept it instead of recreating something which is completely artificial, I think. Any more questions from YouTube or from the audience? No, don't be shy. So there are some more on no, YouTube, more. but... Go ahead. Um, okay. Stieler was also asking at John, if an ambulance of power is not what creates difference in opportunity, then what does? Why are there less people of color and women in positions of power? Isn't this also a result of identity? Um, the sound is getting very thin, but to the extent that I, I heard the question, um, there are definitely disparities that need to be addressed. It's not that these things aren't real. It's just as, as my interlocutor is saying, the methods are ones that need to be questioned. And so it's one thing to try to battle power differentials, to change disparities that are not due to anything about the people in question, but due to barriers that societal procedures have put up. Those things need to be worked against, but gradually with more or less a consensus in society that the way we're going about these things makes sense, as opposed to just shouting down all opposition, applying rather crude solutions, and having these things happen not because people agree, but because they're afraid of being called names. So, 
there are things that need to be fixed in society. I think anybody, you know, left of center and center of center certainly tends to agree with that, and many people right of center. But it's just, how do you change these things? And I think that many people think that the way it's being done these days, the way it's being argued for, is anti-humanistic and oversimplified and often just cruel. That's, that's the issue. It's the methods, not the, the intent. John, did, did you think that applies to both uh, sort of identity politics, if we're talking about wokeness, identity politics, and uh, developments like the Me Too movement, would you include that in this as well? Or do you see this as uh, as kind of a coincidental confluence of, of uh, social phenomena? It's, it's, it's one of these things. The Me Too movement really has had remarkably rapid effect, and it shows that for one thing, societal change is partly a matter of emerging consensus. I don't think that Me Too has progressed as much because of fear as because of an actual emergent awareness of how bad a problem was. And then also that you never quite know how things are gonna turn out. Who could have known that Harvey Weinstein's, you know, deserved public flaying would end up creating a whole reconception in society. And I think that that's a good thing and it has been part of the wokeness culture. But I think that what Me Too is about is less equivocal than what a lot of the more race-oriented woke issues have been. So with the race-oriented woke issues, the idea is, for example, pulling down a statue of somebody who by our lights was a racist but actually did many other things and throwing that statue in the river. That's not gonna elicit as much agreement as Harvey Weinstein's career being destroyed or Harvey Weinstein going to jail or Woody Allen being called out for things that he did, you know, that the media tried to silence, et cetera. So I think that Me Too has more of a leg to stand on. And that's not to say, I think most people would agree that Me Too has led to some mistakes and exaggerations, but that isn't the sum total of what has happened. Whereas it's harder to say that say most of black America lives under the boot of white hegemony and white supremacy and therefore equity must be created at all costs with no opposition brooked at all. And if anybody disagrees, they get called really dirty names and possibly lose their job. That's Orwell. Me too is not Orwell. Me too is a society's moral development. What do you say? To, because the, the, there is an argument that's made, you know, I think by pretty pretty thoughtful people, uh, in, in, including Nazreen, who unfortunately isn't here. But I, I, I do want to include, not that I can speak for her, but I do want to include something that she's said in, in, in the past about cancel culture and that it's basically a myth that cancel culture uh, is a problem and that it exists. And, and uh, you know, she's used this kind of other term, which is consequence culture. Uh, and has said that it's a logical conclusion of your actions, that people who are canceled, that it's basically, you know, they deserved uh, what they got. Uh, and certainly there are, you know, exceptions to this rule, but do, do you think that that is, um, you know, that there's some um, validity to this argument that a lot of the people who have been canceled uh, deserved it? No. And I don't know Nasreen, and I don't know her work, and I mean no disrespect, but if a person can see the total of the cancellations that are happening, at least in American culture, and that's what I know best for the obvious reason, and to actually see that as a matter of consequences rather than canceling, then it indicates the religious aspect that I'm talking about, where the idea is that if you can even be interpreted as not placing battling power differentials front and center, you lose your job. I don't think that would make sense to a critical mass of people. So random example. There was a food writer for the New York Times named Alison Roman. She, in passing, criticized the commercial intents, the commercialism, of two female celebrity people. One of them was Marie Kondo, and the other one was Chrissy Teigen, who is a, a model. She lost her job at the New York Times because she was interpreted as dissing two women of color. Now, first of all, she wasn't dissing them. She was making a moder modest criticism of a kind that a person might make in a jolly interview. 
And two, Marie Kondo is a Japanese citizen. Chrissy Teigen happens to be half Thai. How are those people people of color in any meaningful sense in terms of what we're supposed to be working out during the racial reckoning in the United States? That made no sense at all, especially since Chrissy Teigen and Marie Kondo are more famous and richer than Alison Roman will ever be. And yet this food writer no longer works for the Times because a certain small group of people decided that she was a racist and therefore must be hounded out of her profession. And everybody surrounding her was too afraid to do anything about it. That is not about consequences. She didn't do anything wrong. That was cancel culture. And again, I say, I don't know Nasreen, I'm not thinking of her when I'm saying this, but I would have to say that things have gone beyond what I would be, feel comfortable calling just a culture of, of consequences. I mean, it's a very important question because, I mean, who is able to judge? I mean, who, who is able to punish people? Who can decide these people is going to be punished because he wrote this or he thought this or I think he said this or I think he, he on me? I mean, this is crazy. Mm. I mean, you have a justice. I mean, justice. I mean, um, we spoke briefly about Weinstein or Epstein or Strauss-Kahn. These people have to, to face justice. This is very different. And then they, if they, they, they lose their job, they deserve to lose their job because justice has proved that these people... Uh, made terrible things, now they are criminals. Mm. But then if you suspect a professor to think this or because you didn't like his remark and because you feel on and this, and then you're gonna destroy his life, this is punishment, but who's able to punish? This is a kind of private justice. Well, I, I, I do think that the, uh, one of the big differences between the US and Europe in this regard is that the job protections that people in Europe have would prevent a lot of um, no, but you know, no, reputation. Reputation. I mean, with social media now, reputation, right. and you can kill someone in 15 minutes. Right. You're dead. Well, and, and, and there is, in, in, in the U.S., for people that don't, don't know this, there have been a lot of instances of, of, you know, what you might call collateral damage, in a way, or, or people stumbling into situations that, you know, where they had no attention to offend anybody. Um, and I, I think, John, you will remember this instance with uh, a professor at USC, uh, Greg Patton, who uh, was uh, giving a course online to his students uh, about communication. He taught business communication, and he was speaking about filler words that people use in, in different cultures, and uh, he was referring to a word that is used in uh, Chinese, which means that, 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 people say when they're sort of thinking. Um, like in German, people would say eben, 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 or something. And, um, and this word uh, is, is pronounced uh, naga. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. But um, in any case, some of the people listening to this uh, thought that the word sounded very familiar to the N-word in, in English. And uh, he was actually uh, suspended from teaching this course uh, for, for a while. Um, and, and then later, I believe, uh, re reinstated, but not before this became something of a media sensation and uh, you know, was all over social media and so forth. So he's, he's become a well-known figure because of this. Do you see a lot of this, though, John? I mean, there have been cases of professors, law professors in the US uh, citing case law. Um, you know, referring to cases where the N-word will be used, and even though it, it was in the legal opinion, in the judge's opinion, just because they used the word in, in the classroom, they were uh, suspended, or in one case, at least, uh, actually fired. Are, are, you seeing, are you still seeing that, or have people come to their senses on that front? Um, it's still going on. I think there's a pushback against it, and school is now back in. There was a lull because of summer. But no, cases like that have not been rare. It's not something that just happens occasionally. There are the ones that happen to make the national news because they're especially colorful. But then if you are studying these sorts of things or if you have become an unofficial clearinghouse for these sorts of things, as I and a few other people seem to have but without having actually asked for it, you know that things like this are happening all over the United States all the time. And the vast majority of them are as indefensible as what happened to that professor when he was using that Chinese word. And I would have to say, once again, that's not about consequences. That is a sea change in what people get sanctioned for that wouldn't have made sense to even sensitive people just 15 minutes ago. There's something wrong. 
And that's why people are speaking out and decrying something they call cancel, cancel culture. I think we just about have to end. Is there, does anyone have a burning question? I think we have time maybe for one question from the audience. We've got a question up here in the uh, second row. We have the microphone. It's coming to you from over here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, because I, I think most of the, the people who follow this ideology and who um, would profess that a cancel culture is something good would probably describe themselves as left. And I was wondering if you think there's a danger of conflation between different movements that would be more traditionally left, like people who also criticize capital and war and um, other such power structures. Do you think that there's a conflation happening where some people feel like they have to buy into cancel culture as well? And if yes, do you think there's a way for them to sort of separate themselves from what I, I guess we mostly agree is, is not a very productive movement? I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, for instance, all the big companies, I mean, you know, the um, Facebook and all these companies have adopted, you know, kind of wokeness politics uh, within themselves. But all these companies, I mean, Amazon and I mean, the big, big ones, um, they treat most of their workers extremely badly. So this is a kind of a facade to be progressive, but you, you, you let apart completely the social issues, which has been the traditional uh, motives of the left, at least in Europe. I mean, and they fell in the trap of this identity politics and forgetting what they, they were for at the, at the beginning or till, I don't know, the 70s or the 80s. And, um, and this is, also, of course, also a part of the American, American tradition because you have a very different left from the left in Europe. You don't have a social left so much, but you have this identity politics. And I think this is a terrible trap for the left in Europe. If they, 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 especially, we, we didn't mention something which is very important in Europe, completely different from, uh, from the States, the question of Islamism and even Islam. I mean, the woke movement never questions what's going on in Afghanistan, for instance, never say anything. I mean, Islam is fully protected, nothing to say about this. And, um, and this is very dangerous, I think, for the left, which fought all this history against the church and for secularism, but part of the left is completely paralyzed in front of Islam. Whatever happens, whatever happens to women, for instance, whatever happens in Afghanistan, whatever happens in Iran, whatever. I mean, all these young ladies who fight in these countries for their freedom to, to get out, to get rid of the scarf, they have nothing to say, they're paralyzed. And this is something which is different from the U.S. because you don't have all this... I mean, it's an issue, but it's not such an important issue like in France. But I think this is um, the worst trap for, for, for the left, this identity politics. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're a little bit over time. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you to you both. It was an interesting discussion, despite the fact that we didn't have our female, we missed someone, female colleague uh, here to set us straight. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, in some other forum. Thank you to the audience uh, for your questions, and good evening. Bye.